You're listening to Mercy Calling, a podcast presenting prophetic guidance by the scholars and teachers at Dar al-Turath al-Islami in Cape Town, South Africa. This podcast is brought to you by Seekers Hub Global. You can subscribe to this podcast and all of our other podcasts on iTunes, Google Play, and on our website, seekershub.fm. Visit seekershub.org for free online courses, our reliable answer service, and engaging media. وحبيبنا وشفيعنا وقدوتنا وقرة عيننا ونور قلوبنا وسندنا ومولانا محمد صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد O praise belongs to Allah سبحانه وتعالى and the choicest of blessings and salutations upon our beloved messenger and prophet Sayyidina ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم um, It's a great honor for me this evening to be addressing uh, such beautiful people, but more so to be speaking about one of the greatest females that ever lived. Right? One of the greatest females that ever lived. Our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, in an authentic hadith, and Thursday mornings here at the center we have a ladies class, where we've been speaking and commenting on this hadith over, over a number of weeks. Where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that Kamula min al-rijali kathir, many men have attained a status of perfection. وَلَمْ يَقْفُلْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ إِلَّا أَرْبَعْ However, only four women attained a status of perfection. And then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that they are Maryam, Bin to Imran, Sayyidatina Maryam, the daughter of Imran, Asiya bin to Muzahim, who was the wife of Fir'aun, and then Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Khadija to bin to Khuwailid, Khadija, the daughter of Khuwailid, and we will be speaking about Khadija this, this evening, and then Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he mentioned the fourth and he said, Aisha to, he said, Fatima. Bin to Muhammad in Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Fatima Radiallahu Ta'ala Anha. And then in one narration, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after he mentioned these four women, he added a fifth. So he said, Wafadlu Aisha, and the bounty and virtue of Aisha Radiallahu Ta'ala Anha over all other women is like the bounty and virtue of a special Arab dish that was called Tharid. Tharid is your dish on Eid on a celebration, right? So the Prophet said the virtue of Aisha over all other women is like the virtue of Tharid over all other types of food. So these were the five women that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he made specific reference to when he spoke about those women that attained perfection. Maryam bintu Imran, Asiya bintu Muzahim, Khadija bintu Khuwailid, Fatima al-Batul al-Zahra and then he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam added to that four Aisha bint Abi Bakr bin Siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala so Khadija was listed among the best women ever to have lived the scholars then debated who was the best and because people have a tendency once we know who was the greatest of women they then further debate of those greatest of women who was the greatest of them all so some said Maryam must have been the greatest because some of the scholars held the opinion that she was a prophet of God, a prophet of Allah. But that was an opinion of a minority. Others said no, Asiya should be the greatest. But in the majority they said that the best of those three women was Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha for she was the beloved wife of the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And for reasons that we will come to learn this evening, they stated that she was the best. But then, some scholars came and it added an Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha to this argument. So they said that why are we debating who is the best between Maryam and Asiya and Khadija? What about Fatima? And then the scholars, they were very stern when they said that Fatima should never be added to the debate who is the greatest of all women, because Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Fatima is part of me. Fatima is part of me. Whoever pleases Fatima, pleases me. Whoever angers Fatima, 
angers me. And thus, if Fatima is part of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how can any other female be better than that which is part of Habibuna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And Khadija was her mother. So Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, we all know that the time when she got married to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she was already 40 years of age. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was 25 years old at the time. The age difference between them was 15 years. She was 40, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was 25. And then many a time our story of the life of Khadija begins over there. But Khadija lived 40 years until that point in time. What happened within her life during that 40 years? So we know by her name that she was the daughter of Khuwaili. The father Khuwaili was an honorable and notable person among the Quraysh. Her mother's name was Fatima. Her youngest daughter Fatima was very potentially, it's very possible that she was named after the mother of Khadija Fatima. Uh, Khadija was married twice before getting married to the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Her first husband uh, passed away. Her first husband passed away. And from that, uh, his name was, uh, uh, he was commonly known as Abu Hala, the father of Hala. But his name was actually Hind. Both the names Hala and Hind can be very confusing. Because Hind is a male's name and a female's name. And Hala is also a male's name and a female's name. So the first husband of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, his name was Hind. And his kunya, his patronym was Abu Hala, the father of Hala. Because he had two boys, two young children with Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. The one child's name, they were both boys, was Hala and the other was Hind. Of course, Hind being named after his father. Hind ibn Abi Hala uh, eventually is famously known. He became a companion. He believed in the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He partook in the Battle of Badr and in the Battle of Battle of Uhud. But he's most commonly known for one thing. There's a lengthy hadith that gives us a detailed description of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the narrator of that hadith was Hind ibn Abi Hala, who was the 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 son of Khadija by her first husband, Abu Hala. Right? So Khadija had two sons with him. Hind was the one, Hala was the other. Khadija then got married to another man by the name of Atiq. Then the historians, they differ whether Atiq divorced Khadija or whether he also passed away. And he had a daughter. Khadija had a daughter with Atiq and that daughter's name was also Hind. Can you see how Hind and Hala becomes confusing? Because Khadija... They remember her son's name was Hala, but Khadija also had a sister whose name was Hala. Now you should probably yell them all confused, right? <laughs> so I'll take you. She had a sister, Hala. She had two sons by her first husband. The one's name was Hala, the other was Hind. And by her second husband, Atiq, she had a daughter by the name of Hind. But these two husbands, they were kind, they were good to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. When Khadija's father passed away, she inherited a large sum of money from her father. If I could ask, maybe the sisters could come a bit slightly closer to the front to create some space for the sisters that are in the classroom at the back, inshallah. So that was the previous marriages of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, Khadija bin Tukhwaili. Now you have the era of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered. Khadija is now unmarried for some time. But she's a sort of, sort of the lady. Khadija was known to be the most noble woman in her time. She was known to be the most beautiful woman in her time. She was known to be the most wealthiest woman in her time. These are like all the qualities that you're looking for. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in a hadith, a very famous hadith that is so often quoted at nikah. I always ask myself the question, why? May Allah reward our shuyukh. But why do they always quote this hadith at the nikah? Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that tunkahu al-mar'a mar'atu li arba'in. A lady gets married for four things. Number one said she gets married for is for her beauty. Li jamaliha. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said wa li hasabiha she gets married for her lineage. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said that she gets married for her wealth. So it was because of it, her beauty, her lineage, her wealth. 
And then the Prophet Sallallahu said her deen. And he said, be successful by getting married to a lady that has deen. Those are the four things mentioned in the hadith. Why I ask, why I always ask the question, why I have a problem with this hadith being quoted at the nikah, is because the guy might change his mind. He might think that, you know, <laughs> my wife doesn't necessarily, or my future bride doesn't necessarily have these qualities, and you might be putting doubts in his mind right there at the, on the morning of his nikah. But anyway, so Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha shared everything. She had wealth, she had beauty, she came from a noble family. Not only she was the wealthiest, she was the most noble and the most beautiful woman in Makkah al-Mukarrama. And for that reason, she received proposals from many people. But Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was waiting for something to happen. And this is often not told. Remember, Eventually, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received revelation, who did Khadija take him to? <coughs> to, a, to a cousin. What was the cousin's name? Waraqa ibn Nawfal. Tamam. So, uh, Nawfal was Khadija's father, uh, Khuwaylid's brother. So, Waraqa was a cousin. But of course, a much older cousin because he was much older than Khadija. And because he was much older, and he also had access to divine scriptures of the past, he was a religious man, and Khadija came from a religious family. Khadija used to spend a lot, she used to spend a lot, a lot of time with Waraqa, learning from him things that happened in previous religions about Nabi Ibrahim and Nabi Musa and Nabi Isa. Right? She used to listen to all of these. And then Khadija had a dream. <laughs> As a young girl, she had a dream. And in this dream, she saw the sun setting in her home. She saw the sun setting in her home. So when she woke up from this dream, she went to her cousin Waraka. And she said that I had this dream, can you interpret the dream for me? For me? And then he interp interpreted the dream of Khadija and he said to her that you will get married to the final prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Khadija got married to Abu Halahin, and she got married to Atiq, but Khadija in her heart was waiting for what? She was waiting to get married to the final prophet of her time. That, that seed was planted in her heart when she was a young girl because of a dream. <laughs> right? And when people come to propose, she doesn't see qualities of a prophet in them. So she doesn't bother accepting their proposals. Otherwise, why would she reject the proposal of so many Yani good young suitors. Until eventually, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in Makkah al-Mukarramah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is growing up and he comes from a noble family. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is uh, known for his trustworthiness. The most outstanding quality that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was known for was his truthfulness and his trustworthiness. So Khadija already in her mind thought that this is a youngster, a young man that we should be looking out for. And the, the wasila or the, the medium through which she is going to come to know the Prophet wasallam better is she runs a business. And when she runs a business, she needs men to run the business for her. So she had, she hired the services of male, of men that would come and take her goods transported all the way to Busra in Greater Syria and they would sell the goods for her, purchase goods for her, bring it back and Khadija would pay them accordingly or they would earn profit to whatever the arrangement was but she would hire the services of young men and uh, when Khadija heard of the Prophet wasallam, of course in her heart she desired to hire the services of Rasul wasallam. on the one hand he's trustworthy and reliable and he's truthful but on the other hand, she's already seeing amazing qualities in this young man and perhaps he is the final prophet of our time. At the same time, the Prophet ﷺ's uncle Abu Talib. Everyone knows Abu Talib, right? He was the father of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala. Abu Talib suggests to the Prophet ﷺ, why don't you go into business? Because the Prophet ﷺ was a shepherd now for most of his life. The next phase was, why don't you go into business? Because the Prophet has become 25 years of age. Rasul also needs to get married. 
But he lost his father, he was born an orphan, his mother died, his grandfather died, he's living with Abu Talib. Abu Talib has so many kids in his home, Abu Talib cannot really take full care of the Prophet wasallam to the extent that uh, create work for him and then find a job for him and eventually allow him to get married. So the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Talib suggests to Rasul wasallam, Khadija is hiring men, why don't you consider working for her? When Khadija come to learn that Abu Talib suggested that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam works for her, immediately she took advantage of the, of the opportunity and she approached the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we know that you are a man of trustworthiness and that you are truthful. Take this caravan for us to Busra in Syria, sell the goods, purchase goods, come back home and we will give you double that what we give any other male. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepted. And she sends with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam her young slave boy by the name of Maysara and she says to Maysara that I need you to observe this man. <coughs> right. And Imam al-Shafi and others says the best way you come to know somebody is three things. <coughs> Living with them, traveling with them, and doing business. So Maysara was living with the Prophet He was traveling with the Prophet and he witnessed the business ethic of Rasul So the journey begins. And in this journey, Maysara now witnesses amazing things. Things that cannot be explained. One of the things he witnesses as it comes in the Sahih, that wherever the Prophet walks, there is a cloud giving him shade. Wherever he goes, there is a cloud giving him shade. It's not yet a Prophet. It's Inaya Rabbaniya, divine key. Other narrations said it was not clouds giving him shade, but angels giving him shade. The Prophet ﷺ in this journey came across another monk, not Buhayra. When he was a young boy with his uncle Abu Talib, they came across Buhayra. And Buhayra told the Prophet ﷺ's uncle Abu Talib that that young boy with you is the final prophet of our time. Don't take him with the Syria, send him back home. And Abu Talib sent him back home. Right? Then, on this journey, the Prophet Sallallahu was traveling now with Maysara. They came across another monk whose name slips my mind. I think it was something like uh, Nastur. And this monk spoke to Maysara because the Prophet Sallallahu took rest under a tree and this monk came to Maysara and told him, only prophets have rested under that tree. And then another interaction in, uh, in Busra, in Syria itself, a businessman that was from the people of the book, he also indicated to Maysara that based on the dealings of this man, he seems to be the final prophet of our time. Three instances. And then, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had great business skills. He sold the goods of Khadija. After selling the goods of Khadija, he purchased goods, but he sold at a good price. And yet, he sold at a high price, at a good price. He purchased goods for a very low price, and this allowed the Prophet wasallam to sell the same goods on the same market for a second time and then to purchase goods again for a second time. So by the time the Prophet Muhammad wasallam reached back to Mecca, he profited such an amount that no one ever profited before. And when Khadija heard that, she was very happy. But right now, Khadija is not too worried about how much profit the Prophet wasallam is making. She's waiting to, waiting to speak with Maysara. Maysara, what can you tell me about this man? So Maysara relates to her and says to her that wherever he walked, there were clouds following him. We met the monk, Nastur, and he said that's the final prophet of our time, as well as the businessman that we met in, in Busra of Syria. So Khadija, it's as if her mind was made up. Besides that, uh, Maysara said, that even though I was the servant of the Prophet wasallam, he was so kind to me, he was so beautiful, he was so supporting, that many a times it felt as if he was a slave and I was the master. <laughs> he, he was, Maysara, not only these miracles he related, he related that his speech was beautiful, the way he interacted was beautiful, the way he supported and assisted, so much so that I felt as if I was the master and he was the slave. So Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, when she heard this news from Maysara, that was like the final stamp on her heart, that this has to be my husband, right? This has to be my husband. So she speaks to a friend of her by the name of Nafisa, 
and she relays these feelings over to Nafisa, to which Nafisa says that, I will go and speak to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on your behalf. So Nafisa goes and she says, O oh Muhammad bin Abdullah, Khadija bin Khuwailid has expressed her interest in getting in marriage, in having you as a husband. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, he agreed, but, and this is a lesson, right, for so many of our youth in this time, the first thing Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did was, because his father and mother was not around, he went to his uncles. First Abu Talib, his other uncles were, Abbas, and the other uncle was, not Abu Lahab, he didn't go to him. <laughs> and Muwaffaq, the, the, those who actually believed him eventually only went to them. So it was Abbas and Hamza. Abu Talib, Abbas and Hamza. And then they were all happy and excited about the occasion. And they went in turn not to go and meet Khadija, but to go and meet the, the, the male representatives of the family of Khadija. And the two male representatives that they spoke to was her cousin, the son of her father's brother, yani, Nawfal son Waraqa, and her uncle, uh, who was, uh, what was his name? I think Hizam. And then the khutbah, the khutbah rather, the proposal was a beautiful one. Because Abu Talib spoke now about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he began by praising Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and speaking about the prominence of the lineage from which Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes. And then Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that إِنَّ أَبْنِ أَخِي هَذَا مُحَمَّدُ بْنَ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ لَا يُوزًا بِهِ رَجُلٌ مِّنْ قُرَيْشٍ شَرَفًا وَنُبُلًا وَفَضْلًا إِلَّا رَجَحَ بِهِ and these words of Abu Talib are very important. The relationship Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam shared with his uncle Abu Talib was unbelievable. Because Abu Talib took care of him. Abu Talib loved him, gave preference to him over his own children. So yeah, Abu Talib, he said that my nephew, the son of my brother, my nephew, this nephew of mine, Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, was, was, was any man among the Quraysh to be weighed with him in terms of honor, in terms of nobility, and in terms of virtue, the Prophet ﷺ would outweigh them. There's no one in the Quraysh like him. That's the first thing he said. وَهُوَ وَإِنْ كَانَ فِي قِلٍ فَإِنَّ الْمَالَ ظِلٌ زَائِلٌ وَأَمْرٌ حَائِلٌ He said even though he وسلم, does not have wealth, you should know that wealth is like a shadow that eventually disappears. Shadows don't remain forever. وَأَمْرٌ حَائِلٌ وَعَارِيَةٌ مُسْتَرْجَعَةٌ It's a loan that eventually is taken away from us. We are given wealth for a set number of days or years and then it's taken away from us. So you should know this is the nature of wealth. اليوم معك وغداً يكون مع فلان وفلان Today wealth is with you, tomorrow to someone else. وهذا يكون غنياً ثم فقيراً You find someone today is wealthy, tomorrow he's poor. And today someone might be poor and tomorrow he may be wealthy. And then he said, وَبَعْدَ هَذَا هُوَ وَاللَّهِ لَهُ نَبَأٌ عَظِيمٌ He said, after that, we expect amazing things from him. This was Abu Talib speaking about Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَخَطَبٌ جَلِيلٌ جَسِيمٌ And he continued saying, mentioning qualities of the Prophet until he said, وَلَهُ فِي خَدِيجَةَ بِنْتُ خُوَيْلِدْ رَغْبَةً And he has desire to get married to Khadija, the daughter of Khuwailid as how she has desire to get married to him. And if you agree, then I will cover his sadaq, said Abu Talib. The Prophet ﷺ sadaq eventually, sadaq is the Arabic word for, uh, for mahr. Right? Uh, which is the money a man pays over to his wife and the occasion of marriage. A, a dowry is not a accurate translation. The dowry is actually well that the lady needs to pay the husband. And so, the dowry is not the accurate translation. So, the sadaq or mahar is money that the husband pays to a lady on the occasion of marriage. Abu Talib said, I will cover it. Khadija sadaq eventually was 20 young camels. 20 young camels. That's a lot of money. And Abu Talib, he paid 
the sadaq of the Prophet sallallahu to Khadija. Then, Warakai ibn Nawfal responded. And he expressed his delight and desire for their family to be connected to the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And thus, the marriage concluded. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the occasion of the marriage, they slaughtered, one narration says one camel, another narration says another camel. Food was made and people were, were fed as the walima or the reception of his marriage. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this was the best marriage in Makkah al-Mukarramah, the most noblest of families, the most handsome individual, the most trustworthy. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam getting married to Khadija bin Khuwaili. Now, for the next few years of marriage, how many years? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is 25 years old. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa eventually is going to receive revelation at the age of 40. In that next 15 years, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha displays unbelievable qualities. Right? She does that that which no lady has ever done and no lady will ever be able to do. She was remarkable. The companions, Khafid bin Hajr al-Qalani in Isat al-Bari said that Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha never ever angered the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ever. She never said anything that caused him to be upset. She never did anything that caused him to be upset. The other wives of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that was like normal marriages. Challenges, very exciting challenges. The Prophet loved all his wives and all of them were amazing role models for us. But none of them were like Khadija radiallahu ta'ala. Never ever did she do anything that upset the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in any way. Subhanallah. Today for a lady just not to say anything is a miracle. <laughs> I, my, I, I mentioned this when I covered the story of Khadija. A few months ago, uh, my, my granny, may Allah be pleased with her, right? Uh, she, she, on a, a few weeks before she passed away, she called me, so she said, Abdurrahman, she spoke to me in Afrikaans, she said, do you know what? I don't know if she overheard my wife shouting at me. <laughs> but she said, do you know what, Abdurrahman? For all my life that I lived with your dada, your grandfather, I never once backchatted. I never once responded to him. He, he, she told me she used to work, you know, used to be a foreman on a building site. And he used to come home sometimes angry, looking for food and in a bad mood. And I would just be quiet. And a day or two later when he was in a better mood, I would say to him that, you know, two days ago, when you came home angry, that was not right. That was not fair. Right? But... Never did I back chat him, she said. And a woman of before was an amazing woman. But Khadija was something else. She never did anything that ever angered the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She never ever back chatted. She never ever complained. She never ever. She was just unbelievable. And on top of that, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she's the only wife of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that gave him children. So we know the first child she gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a boy and his name was Qasim. But Qasim passed away. It was just about over a year when he passed away. And that was challenging for Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When Qasim passed away, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he noticed that his uncle Abu Talib has many kids. And then he approached the, his uncle Abu Talib and said, let Ali come and stay with us. So Ali lived and grew up in the home of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, uh, on the one hand, because the Prophet ﷺ wanted to repay the favor to Abu Talib, when Abu Talib took care of him when he was a young boy, but also so that Ali radiallahu ta'ala an could fill that gap in Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa heart when his son passed away. His daughters were Ruqayya and Zainab, <coughs> Umm Kulthum and Fatima. Khadija also gave birth to another son, and that son's name was? Sorry? They, they give three names. 
But one is the original name and the others are just um, sort of nicknames or qualities of the young boy. Uh, Tahir, Tayyib, and some other name that's slipping my mind now. So those are the it's names given, but there was one, another son that he had. That son also passed away at a young age. So his daughters were, again, Ruqayya, Zainab, Umm Kuthum, and Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. Um, Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha was born approximately five years before the advent of prophethood. She was born on the same day when the Quraysh was rebuilding the Kaaba. And then they reached the black stone. And then they debated which tribe, sub-tribe of the Quraysh would have the honor of placing the black stone in its rightful place. And they debated until there was nearly civil war. Who's going to have that honor? And then they came to the agreement, whoever walks next in by the doors of the haram, he will have the honor of deciding who gets to place the black stone in his rightful place. And when the Prophet Muhammad wasallam entered, everyone shouted out, Al Amin, Al Amin, the trustworthy one, the trustworthy one. And then the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, and this showed his diplomacy, the skill Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to take a very challenging situation and make the best out of it. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he took off his shawl, he placed it on the ground, he placed the, had him place the black stone on the shawl, and he said one member of each tribe will take a corner of the shawl, and collectively raise the black stone to where it should be. And that was an amazing ability of the Prophet wasallam because there was nearly a civil war that he stopped with his wisdom, his hikmah. And then Rasul wasallam with his blessed and noble hands lifted the black stone until he placed it in his rightful place in the Kaaba. Ya Rabb. However, that was not the amazing thing that happened that day. After Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam placed the stone in the black, in the, in the, the black stone in the Kaaba, someone came running into the haram, telling Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that your wife Khadija just gave birth now to your fourth or fifth child. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam home, and it was Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha that was born. And she was the most beloved of all children to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she was the most beloved of all children to her mother Khadija. So how many children is now in the home of Khadija? Firstly, from this five years, plus minus five years before prophethood, the Prophet Muhammad wasallam started spending a lot of time in the cave of Hira. <coughs> now, why all of this detail? Because Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha's life is tied into the life of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. If the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is spending time in the cave of Hira, Who's running the fort back home? Another amazing thing is that Khadija was 40 when she got married to the Prophet And how many children did she give him? Six. After the age of 40. The, the, the last son that passed away, Tayyib or Tahir, was born after Prophethood. At the advent of Prophethood, Khadija anha was 55. So after 55, she still gave birth to another child. That's remarkable. But remember, and this is very important to remember, the Prophet ﷺ is now in the cave of Hira. How long? Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha transmits that before Prophethood Rasul wasallam, he had many mubashirat. There were many signs indicating to the fact that he is the Prophet of his time. From those signs, wherever many a times the Prophet walked past, a stone, and a stone would greet the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam saying, Assalamu alaikum ya Muhammad. Right? And that's in the authentic narrations. Assalamu alaikum ya Muhammad. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told the companions this when he was in Medina. He said, I know of a stone that used to greet me in Mecca and if you want, I can go and show you that stone now. I remember our teacher said, Habib Umar, when he mentioned this particular narration, he said that, do you think that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will remember a stone that greeted him, but he won't remember you and I when we greet him. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum ya Sayyidi ya Rasulullah. So, these were signs. The Prophet ﷺ had dreams and those dreams used to come true. And Rasul ﷺ, towards five years prior his prophethood, the Prophet would spend a lot of time in the cave of Hira. 
He would go there, spend three days at a time, seven days at a time, ten days at a time, up to two months at a time, the Prophet would remain in solace by himself, in Khalwa, in the cave of Hira. But now, the question is that, what happens at home when the Prophet is in the cave of Hira? Khadija is running at home. And now the question then is, who's all, how many people is Khadija taking all care of in her home? I, I counted them, and there were at least nine people that she was taking care of by herself, without complaining once. So we know that she had her four daughters. We mentioned their names. Besides the four daughters, who else lived in the home of Khadija? Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu. Besides Sayyidina Ali, her children from her previous marriages, Hind, the son, Hind, the daughter, Hala, the son. Eight. Who else? In that same time, the Prophet Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha received a slave from her uncle. What was his name? Zayd ibn Haritha. When Zayd ibn Haritha, she brought him home, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Khadija, will you gift him to me? And then she gifted Zayd to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon which the Prophet sent him, set him free. So who was also living in the home? Zayd ibn Haritha. So that's at least nine people. That besides other servants that Khadija might have had. So who's in that home? Who's taking care of nine children? Who's cooking for nine children? Who's running the business? Who's taking care of the sales? The buying and the selling? She is just an amazing lady that's taking care of nine people in a home. Right? She really has eight children. And the Prophet ﷺ set free Zayn ibn Haritha and adopts him as a son. What? Imagine you have eight children, our sisters, and your husband come home and said, I adopted a son. He's staying with us from today. <laughs> but for Hadija, that's nothing. Whatever her husband wants, whatever the Prophet ﷺ says, and he's not yet a prophet. So she's taking care of that family. She's preparing food. She's running the business. Because the business is what is supporting them. On top of that, Khadija is serving her husband. So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he can carry how many provisions with him to the cave of Hira? He can only take enough provisions that might suffice him for three or four or five days. But if he's staying there for a month or two months, so Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anna, after taking care of a family of nine and a business and everything else, every now and then in the evening, she would take provisions and carry it by foot to the cave of Hira. How far is the cave of Hira from the home of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anna's home used to exist until recent. If you go online on Google, you can still Google Photos of the home of Khadija radiallahu anha. They'll show you where the room of Fatima was. They'll show you where she stayed with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa They'll show you where the Prophet used to make ibadah. In that home, they also showed you where the storage space of Khadija's goods were kept. But with the expansion of the haram, the home was not preserved. We all agree that the haram must be expanded to accommodate people. But as far as possible, if you are able to preserve religious sites, Religious sites should be preserved. Today, the home of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, the leader of that sect, his home was preserved in Saudi Arabia, it's a museum. But the house of Khadija could not be preserved as a museum. On top of that, Allah knows best, I don't know how true this is. So sometimes, unfortunately, lies creep in, so one cannot really ascertain the truth. But they say that on the home of Khadija, a block of toilets were built. Right? <laughs> Allah knows best. But, it used to be there and Hujaj of Awul could actually visit the home of Khadija. And that's in this area of the Haram. The point I'm coming to is that how long did it take you from the Haram to Cave Hira? Jabal Noor, those of us who went there. By bus or by car, it could take you around 10 minutes. And that's 10 minutes when you nicely driving through the mountain in a tunnel. So how long do you think it must have taken Khadija to reach the cave of Hira to Mount Nur? When there were no roads and there were no tunnels. But 
She, after taking care of her family, just imagine. Today, woman, and this is not, we not this, is, this, is, this is an encouragement for our sisters and for our brothers as well, because we come to learn in the Sunnah of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he assists when he was home, he assists with the cooking, when he was home, he assists with household chores, with his blessed, noble, illuminated hands, you would sweep, you would cut meat. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ was very helpful at home. But in terms of carrying and taking responsibility of that home, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha was really something else. So after taking care of the family, just think kids, they must be bathed, they must be washed, they must be, go to bed, they must eat. And after all of that, she prepares food and she travels by foot through a rocky path over a mountain until she comes to Jabal Nur, where she gives provisions to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu so that he can remain in the cave of Hira worshipping his Lord for an extra few days. But the scholars, they said that there were times when Khadija would spend the night with Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa because it's silence in the cave of Hira, Mount Nur, there's no no one living there. So when Khadija came on from afar, perhaps with a light, perhaps without a light, the Prophet could hear that she was coming. And when he heard that his wife was coming because he did not request to ask her for this, she just did it out of her own. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to descend Mount uh, Nur, not expecting Khadija to climb all the way to the top. So he would come down to the bottom. And they said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would meet Khadija on the foot of Mount Nur, under the full moon and the stars shining bright in the skies and the scholars they said do not ask about those beautiful romantic evenings that the Prophet sped, spent under the stars in the middle of the desert with his most beloved wife Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha the Musamara they call it so she sometimes overnight overnighted with the message of Muhammad and they spent beautiful time together until eventually we all know that uh, on one occasion while the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in the cave of Hira Jibreel came to him Jibreel came to him and Jibreel said to the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Iqara and the response of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was that Ma ana biqari I'm not a reciter I'm unlettered the Prophet could neither read nor write and then the Prophet grabbed hold of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, squeezed him tightly, hatta balagha minni al jahda, said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if my energy was all pressed out of me, and then the Prophet said again to me, recite, if Jareel said again, recite. And this happened for three times until eventually the first verse of the Quran was revealed, and this was at a momentous occasion. At that point in time, the Quran is now revealed upon this earth for the very first time. Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al insana min, Alaq, Iqara wa Rabbuka al-Akram, alladhi allama bin qalam. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now, for you to understand who was his support, who was his pillar, where did he find his strength from? This narration makes it very clear, because the first place the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam runs to, after that experience of receiving revelation for the first time, was he ran straight to the home of Khadija, not to the home of Khadija, straight to the lap of Khadija. And Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha then covered him. He said, Zammiluni, Zammiluni. And Khadija covered him. Dathiruni, Dathiruni. Until the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam calmed down and then he explained to Khadija what happened. And her immediate words was to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, La yughziq Allahu abada. Allah will never disgrace you. Allah will never disgrace you. She had conviction in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even before he was a prophet. So her immediate words was, Allah will never disgrace you. And then she said, you support your family when they require your assistance. You feed the poor and the needy. You join family ties. You have all these amazing qualities. Allah will never disgrace you. So his support was there. The scholars, they said that the message of Islam on the occasion of the revelation of the Quran, the message, the beginning of Islam started in the arms of a lady, 
the arms of Khadija, and the message of Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam ended in the lap of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha because that's where he passed away. So the beginning of his prophethood sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the physical end of his prophethood was between the arms of a lady and the lap of a lady. Now Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha her role is going to change big time because she was now supporting the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in terms of things that a lady supports her husband in in terms of taking care of the kids and taking care of the family and running, taking charge of the home and she was amazing in that but the bigger test lies ahead because now Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa received revelation Ya ayyu al muddathir kum fa anvir wa rabbaka fa kabbir wa thiyabaka fa tahir wa rujaza fahjur Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now instructing the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that you need to call all these people that are ascribing partners unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you need to call them to one Allah. It's not a, an easy, you, you, one man have to call the whole world to Islam. What would you do? One man has to call the whole world to Islam. So Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, what she does is her cousin, remember her cousin, Waraqa ibn Nawfal, he, he's of old age, he's blind at the time already. She says, come to my cousin, he'll be able to advise us. He's been reading scriptures of those before. When they come to Waraqa ibn Nawfal, the Prophet sallallahu explains to him what happens. He says that this is the same archangel that brought revelation to Nabi Musa and you are the final prophet of our time. And he said, how I wish I, would have, I could be there to support you when your people will cast you out of Makkah al mukarram The Prophet said, Awa mukhrijiyahum. Remember Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is still trembling because of a revelation that came to him. Right? And now, after revelation came, he has the responsibility of calling the world to Allah, to Islam. And then, Waraka ibn Nawfal, the first news he gets is your people is going to cast you out of society. Right? And then Waraqa ibn Nawfal told him, there is no prophet that came with the message that you come with, except that he was abandoned by his people. So the Prophet sallallahu starts spreading the message, and the very, very first person to believe in him was Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. That is an amazing honor. Right? Today, we're always boasting about, about coming first in what? In my math test. Or I came first in a race. Or I ran the race. And my 10Ks I did it sub 60. Right? Everyone would be posting about different things. And who comes first in different things? Who can say I was the first? Khadija's tongue was the first tongue ever to say Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah wa Ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. There was no one that recited that testimony before Khadija radiallahu ta'ala. She was the first person to say, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, wa Ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. And she, not, she, she did not only recite that with her tongue, she believed it so much in her heart that she was now prepared to sacrifice everything she had for this cause. And that's exactly what she did. From the most wealthiest lady, every sin she had, she spent it in the cause of Islam. She spent it to support the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whenever the Prophet ﷺ went through challenges, when they strangled him in front of the Kaaba, when they dumped the inside of camels on him, Khadija was there to support him. Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala, and he narrated that. He said there wasn't a challenge that Rasul wasallam had, there wasn't ugly words that were pronounced and said to the Prophet wasallam. say that when he came home, Khadija would console him, and Khadija would say beautiful things about him until his spirit would be uplifted. So can you imagine the relationship that they had? They had a beautiful relationship where they cared for each other, where they loved each other, where they supported each other. So Khadija now, whatever she has, she's spending and sacrificing in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. During this time, a number of amazing things happened. Um, 
Jibreel on one occasion comes to the Prophet ﷺ. So he, he comes to Rasul ﷺ and he says, Ya Rasulullah, Khadija is about to enter your room and she's carrying with her a vessel. In that vessel is food, idam, or in that vessel, which is gravy, or food, or drink. She's coming with a vessel to bring you something to eat. When she enters, عليها السلام من ربها. When she enters, convey Allah's salams to her. Convey Allah's salams to her. She was unique in that. She was the only companion that received a greeting from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the manner in which his respondent spoke of her intelligence. So when she entered, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to her that Jibreel was here by me now. And Jibreel asked me to inform you that Allah convey his salams to you. So Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha responded by saying, Allahumma anta salam. Oh Allah, you are a salam. Wa minka salam. And from you is salam, peace. Wa ilayka ya'udu salam. And to you salam will return. Right? The famous dua that we recite after all, salam, was the dua and the words of Khadija when she received salam from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam. Wa ilayka ya'udu salam. On another occasion, in the initial part of the mission of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and again the intelligence of Khadija, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told her that Jibreel is with me. So for her to ascertain whether it is true, truly an angel of Allah, because Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was back and forth initially. Right? Who is this angel that has come to visit me? So Khadija sat on the right of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she asked, do you see him? The Prophet said, yes, I see Jibreel. She sat on the left, she said, do you see him? She said, yes, I see Jibreel. And then Khadija removed the scarf. And then she asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa do you see him? And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded, no, he's gone. And then she said that that is definitely an angel from Allah. For an angel will not remain in the room while a lady's head is uncovered. And had it been a shaitan, he would not have gone. The intelligence. So eventually, and we need to come to the end, uh, after seven years of struggle in Makkah al mukarramah eventually Muslims are banned from Makkah al mukarramah to the valley of Abu Talib. The request is that hand Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam over to us so we can have him killed. The Banu Hashim and the Banu Al-Muttalib, which is headed by Abu Talib, they refuse. And thus, Muslim and non-Muslim all are banned from Mecca, and they go sitting in the valley of Abu Talib. They remain there for three years. And this was a very difficult time for the believers. A very difficult time. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, the last of her money was spent in the valley of Abu Talib. Whatever she had was spent so that the companions radiallahu ta'ala anhum can survive. Whatever they had. Whatever she had. Her, her cousin, Hakim ibn Hizam, I spoke about him earlier, I spoke about the father earlier. Hakim ibn Hizam on one occasion came bringing the last of her food to the valley of Abu Talib. And then he met up with Abu Jahal and they entered into a fight because people were prohibited from supporting the Muslims in any way. You couldn't marry off your children to them. You cannot get married to them. You cannot sell to them. You cannot buy from them. You cannot interact with them. You cannot sit with them. They were completely cut off from society. Sanctions to a completely different level. Right, today, uh, for whatever political reasons, uh, Saudi plays sanctions on Qatar, but Qataris can still make Hajj at least. Those were sanctions that you can never imagine. You can't talk to them, you can't speak with them, you can't interact with them, you can't sit with them, you can't sell, you can't buy, nothing. And uh, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, the very loss of the wealth she spent on the companions at that time, so that they could survive. Because the struggle in the valley of Abu Talib, Shah Abi Talib was unbelievable. The Muslims they ran out of food, right? They started eating leaves of trees. This is a real story. Right, things became bad. They said at night 
during the camp at the, in the valley of Abu Talib, all you heard was babies crying and women crying. Abdullah ibn Abbas was born, mind you, during those three years in the Shia of Abu Talib. So life carried on. There's one narration, I don't know its authenticity, they said because the companions were forced to eat leaves of trees, they, they, their stool began resembling that of goats. I, I, you know, sometimes we just need to sit down and realize that this is a reality. This really happened. The companions really sacrificed like that. And therefore, in terms of the companions, Ridwanullah ta'ala ali majma'een, you have companions of various levels. Right? And in general, the highest level of companions is the Muhajirun. The companions of Makkah that immigrated to Medina. And then the Ansar. Right? And then those who accepted Islam after Fat Makkah. The companions, not in my eyes, in the Quran had rank. Allah drew a distinction between the Muhajirun and the Ansar. And Allah drew a distinction between then the scholars, they mentioned the Ashra Mubashara and those who fought in the Battle of Badr and so forth and so on. And therefore, while we love and respect every single companion, and we don't criticize not one of them, and uh, the lowest ranking companion is 100,000 times better than anyone that came after them. But among the companions, there was ranks. And all companions cannot be placed on one page. We need to acknowledge the rank that is referred to in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And right on top of that, is Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. She's not only from the Muhajirun, she's like the mother taking care of the companions in that camp. <laughs> she's taking care of them with her wealth that she worked for, that she earned. Until Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha in this camp, she took ill. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa uncle Abu Talib also took ill. The amazing thing about Abu Talib was in this camp when he took ill, he, he would go into states of unconsciousness and then into consciousness. And whenever he came into a state of consciousness, he would ask, where is my nephew Muhammad? Is he fine? Is he okay? He feared that they may kill him. Abu Talib made the Prophet ﷺ sleep in different tents in that camp. So he wouldn't sleep in one tent every night. He would move around from tent to tent so that the disbelievers never know where he is. Until eventually one morning Rasul ﷺ woke up and he told Abu Talib that the contract that they wrote out, that was they hung in the Kaaba, that stated that no interaction and no selling and no sitting and no speaking with us in this valley should happen between the people of Makkah and the Banu, 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 Banu Muttalib and the Banu Hashim. He said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said insects and they ate the entire contract and all that remains is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Abu Talib went to the Quraysh and he said that my nephew has prophesied, if you wish, that this has happened inside the Kaaba. If it is true what he says, then we should be allowed entry back into Makkah. And then they agreed. If it is true what he said, because how is on earth is it possible for the Prophet wasallam, who is in the valley of Abu Talib to know what's happening inside the Kaaba, and not only what's happening inside of the Kaaba, a miracle where everything of the contract, the conditions of the uh, sanctions is mentioned, everything is eaten up except the name of Allah. So they agreed. They thought there's no way this could possibly happen. And then when they went to the Kaaba, they found it exactly as how the Messenger Muhammad wasallam said, and they were allowed entry into Makkah once again. Some of the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, based on a number of these narrations, they... Uh, believe that Abu Talib was from the successful, from the believers. Even though the majority did not hold that position. The majority attached themselves to the hadith where the Abu Talib died without iman. But at the same time, there were scholars like um, Zaini Dahlan, one of the great ulama of Makkah al-Makarnama, who wrote a book on the najat of Abu Talib. No. But nonetheless, um, the value of Abu Talib comes to an end and Muslims are now returning to Makkah. When they return to Makkah, two people are still ill. Abu Talib is still ill and Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha is still ill. Who are they? 
people that are beloved to Rasul people that supported him people that sacrificed their own comfort for him people that sacrificed their wealth for him right they were these the greatest supports Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam had in that first 10 years in Makkah al mukarramah was his uncle Abu Talib and his wife Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And when they returned, three months after they returned to Makkah al mukarramah his uncle Abu Talib passed away. And this was very difficult for Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Very difficult. Not only that, Abu Talib's wife's name was also Fatima. And uh, she was like a mother to the Prophet ﷺ. She took care of him like a mother took care of her children. The Prophet ﷺ was uh, really attached to Fatima. When, when Sayyidina Ali's mother, Fatima, passed away, Rasulullah ﷺ dug a grave with his own hands. He entered the grave. Before she was placed in the grave, he entered the grave and he made dua for her. From the dua that he made was that... Uh, وَوَسِعْ مُدْخَلَهَا and he, uh, he said that uh, you know, part of a dua that we often read that normally ends with وَغْسِلْهَا بِالْمَاءِ وَثَلْجِ وَالْبَرَدِ and the Prophet ﷺ said بِحَقْ through the right and the rank of your Prophet and the Anbiya before me as Imam Tabarani narrates in his in his Ma'ajam Kabir that's one of the daleels of turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through a medium so the Prophet ﷺ made dua for the mother of Ali bin Abi Talib in her grave as Tabrani narrate in an authentic hadith that oh Allah expand her grave and uh, cleans her as how a white thobe garment is cleaned when washed and then he said through the rank and status of your prophet referring to himself and all anbiya before me so when Abu Talib passed away this is like his own family it's like a father of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam that passed away and this was very painful Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was hurting. And when he hurts, we hurt because we love him. And anything that caused him pain caused us pain. So when you reflect on those moments, we can't imagine what it must have been like for Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But that was his uncle. And then three days after his uncle passes away, Khadija passes away. His most beloved wife. There was no one that he loved the way he loved her. Even after the demise, the Prophet showed his love for her. So the Prophet sallallahu he would slaughter, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said, he would slaughter a lamb and he would cut up the meat and distribute it among the friends of Khadija. Aisha said that I was a jealous wife. But I wasn't jealous over any of the wives. When Aisha lived with the Prophet sallallahu he had nine wives. He said I was a jealous wife, but I wasn't jealous over any of the wives like the Prophet sallallahu like I was jealous of Khadija. And then she said, I didn't even meet her. Meaning that she was not the wife of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or the Prophet was married to Khadija. I did not even meet her, she said. And on one occasion, as Imam Bukhari narrates, Khadija's sister Hala came knocking on his door. Hala bin to Khawaili. She knocked on the door of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam seeking permission to enter. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, just by hearing the way Hala sought permission to enter his home, he thought of who? Khadija. So he shouted out out of joy, Allahumma ya hala, oh Allah, hala has come to visit us. So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha became upset. Aisha's relationship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was amazing. We're speaking about that Thursday mornings, right? They just had like a very, very exciting relationship. Right. So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was much more daring than any of the wives of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa Never, that doesn't mean that she... Did not have this. No, she had the most beautiful relationship with the Prophet ﷺ. But she was much more daring because she was young and beautiful and intelligent and active. So she says to Rasul ﷺ, Mazara tadkur ajuza min is Makkah. You're always speaking about this old lady from Makkah. She said, Hamra ashid qain. The inner, inside of her mouth is red. And what she meant thereby is that she had no teeth. Right? Khadija radiallahu anhu was 65 years old when she passed away. Amra ashid qayn. And then Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, because she was intelligent and young and beautiful, she said that waqad abdalaka Allahu khayran minna. Allah has granted you better than Khadija. <laughs> so Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, as it comes in the Musab of Imam Ahmad, 
She said Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became angry like I never ever saw him become angry. كَأَنَّمَا فُقِّدَتْ عَلَى وَجْنَتَيْهِ الرُّمَّانِ As if pomegranate was squeezed out on his cheeks. And then he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Khadija stood by me when no one was there for me. Khadija, Khadija spent her money when no one was prepared to spend her, their money. Khadija supported me. She believed in me when no one believed in me. And he continued mentioning the qualities of Khadija until the Prophet said to Aisha, وَمَا أَبْدَلَنِي اللَّهُ خَيْرًا مِنْهَا Allah never granted me anyone better than Khadija. So three days after his uncle passed away, Khadija passes away. The whole year became known as a year of sadness. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was broken. Because despite the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the best of Allah's creation, and no man resembles him, he was a human being. And human beings experience pain. The Prophet Sallallahu heart was broken. He was hurting after he lost Khadija. A few months thereafter, his daughter Ruqayya <coughs> came back from Abyssinia. Right? That time she was married to Sayyidina Uthman. She came back from Abyssinia. And there was no communication. And, 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 and I read this incident because these are real events. When Rukaya came and she met her father, she saw Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she came running to her father out of happiness. The Prophet his response was happiness. And then he hugged his daughter Rukaya. Either Rukaya or Zaina. I think it was more Zaina. He hugged his daughter Zaina. And then she asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how is my mother? And the Prophet couldn't reply. He just cried. And when Rasulullah cried, she knew something is wrong. Then she rang to Fatima and the first thing he said, what happened to my mother? And Fatima broke the news to her that our mother Khadija passed away. Ya Rab. The Prophet always loved her. He always loved her. Jibreel came on that same occasion when Allah conveyed his salam to Khadija. Jibreel told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi inform Khadija that Allah built a palace for her in Jannah. Allah built a palace in Jannah. And uh, our time is upright, but one, one last narration. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is attachment to Khadija in Fath Makkah. Fath Makkah would be, um, the Prophet <laughs> remained 13 years in Makkah. Which means three years after the passing of Khadija, they made Hijrah. After the Hijrah, Fath Makkah took place in the 8th year of the Hijrah. 11 years after Khadija passed on, when the Muslims conquered Makkah. Before entering into Makkah, the Prophet ﷺ camped on the outskirts of Makkah. The, the, the outskirts of Makkah then uh, was, because Makkah may be beyond this point, but the inhabited Makkah was not beyond that point. So it was considered outskirts. If any of us who visited Makkah visited uh, what they call Masjid al Jinn. That was considered to be outskirts, because people weren't staying there. Where Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam met Jinn and conveyed the message to them, that's where Masjid al-Jinn is built. And opposite Masjid al-Jinn is the main entrance to the graveyard in Makkah al-Makarrama. The Mi'la or Ma'la or Mu'alla, different pronunciations for the graveyard. Right? Uh, in the middle of the graveyard is a highway, if you can picture it. And on the other side of the highway, that's where Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha lies buried, on a, on a hill. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before entering Makkah on the occasion of Fath Makkah, he camped over there. When he camped over there, he told the companions to make more fires than usual. In other words, when they would camp at night and make a fire, and let's say you would have 20 people sitting around the fire, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, let five people sit around one fire, which means you're going to be making much more fires than what is required. And when doing so, the disbelievers will think that we are more than what we really are. And therefore the disbelievers, they put up no fight the next day of Fatima Makkah because they believed that this army was much bigger than what it really was. But when they reached the outskirts of Makkah, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he instructed his companions, set up my tent next to the grave of my wife Khadija. The, I read a very beautiful post by uh, one of the scholars, Anna Bullusi. He said, 
that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instructed his companion to set his tent up on the eve of the conquest of Makkah. That's victory for Islam in the Arabian Peninsula. On the eve instructed and set my tent next to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala and had because she is part of this victory. As her efforts and her sacrifices in that initial days in Makkah that paved the way for Islam to become the Islam that it is and for us to conquer Makkah tomorrow. And then he instructed his companions to camp around the area where Masjid al-Jin is built today. So he camped. He spent the night. Sometimes, uh, because of foreign ideologies and ideas about the visitation of graves, we all have this. Uh, it's almost as if, even though this never existed among our people, we have, it's as if we have a fear of visiting graves, or we fear of speaking about the visitation of graves. This is the Prophet of Allah setting up a tent alongside the grave of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala. The Prophet told us, just uh, for us to reflect in an authentic hadith that transmitted by Imam Ahmad in his Musnad, that the deceased among the believers, they find contentment, they find contentment and happiness when the living relatives come to visit them. And that's the Prophet visited. Say that in Fatima radiallahu ta'ala, in radiallahu ta'ala anha, every Friday would leave her home in Medina and travel all the way to the area of the Battle of Uhud to visit the grave of her uncle Hamza. As Imam Hakim transmitted in his Mustadrak. Right, so, just a side point why we should start visiting the graveyard more often, especially our brothers. Especially our brothers. Make dua for family members that have passed on. You know, recite Quran for them. Make dua for them. If the Prophet said they find comfort when you visit, that means that they are aware that you are there. And if that is the state of the ordinary believer, then what about the Anbiya, the Prophets? And what about the saints and the awliya? So, we've come to the end of our presentation on the life of Khadija. Even though, uh, when I... Khadija's story requires more time and there are other aspects that one needs to focus on. Time uh, does not allow us, when we spoke about Khadija in our Thursday morning class, we covered her over, I think, two or three weeks, which was two to three hours. Um, but this is the essence of her story. This is the effort, essence of her struggle, of her plight, of her assistance to the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's the best story between husband and wife that was ever told. Not necessarily the story that I related, but the story that is documented between Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Khadija is the best story that was ever documented. There was nothing like it. There was no couple like them. There was no love like the love they shared for each other, a love that continued even after her demise. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala allow us to be in the company of Khadija. She is our mother. Right? She's Ummul Mu'mineen, which means she's our mother. We must love her. The Prophet wants us to love her. The Prophet wants us to love his family. إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَةَ Allah said in the Quran. The Prophet wants us to love them. And we need to start loving them. And we love them by speaking about them. By reading about them. By acknowledging their status. By acknowledging their position. A position and a status that was afforded to them. Not by you or I, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a special bond with Khadija. A special bond. You cannot go to Makkah without visiting a grave. You cannot go to Makkah without visiting the grave of Khadija. And when you visit the grave, you experience an amazing feeling of tranquility and contentment. Right? May Allah allow us to see her face. Allah allow us to see a face in the, the Habib Umar Mihdari said in his poem that Arina wajhar rasuli wal khadija wal batuli Oh Allah, show us the face of your messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Also show us the face of Khadija wal batul and her daughter Fatima Arina wajhar rasuli wal khadija wal batuli wa bani zahra al fuhuli and the children of Sayyidatina Fatima zahra al Hassan al Hussein and all of the companions, may Allah allow us to see them and be resurrected in their company. May Allah allow us to be with them. I apologize for, uh, I think I'm over time.
I don't know what time limit is actually given. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. There's a beautiful poem um, that uh, I actually told myself I'm going to translate it and then share it this evening. But uh, I unfortunately didn't find the time today. Hopefully, if Allah permits, I could still hand it out. Or you, still, you could collect a copy rather at the center um, early next week, inshallah. A poem that speaks about the life of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And the beautiful thing about the poem is that you can recite it, and we often recite it in our gatherings, and in it is the, the gist of a life story. So within uh, three, two, three minutes, you read through a qasida, and it allows you to reflect on most of the points that we made this evening regarding the life of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, and that's the beauty of, of poetry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala ali wa sahbihi wa sallam. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-musaneen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alayhi. Thank you for listening to Mercy Calling, the Darul Turath al-Islami podcast. If you like this podcast, we'd appreciate if you left us a review on iTunes and Google Play. Help Seekers Hub build a global Islamic seminary and spread the light of guidance to millions around the world by supporting us through monthly donations by going to seekershub.org donate. Your donations are tax deductible in the U.S. and Canada.